Hi, and welcome back. I'm Simi Lerner, and this is the Judaism From Within podcast, titled so because we attempt to understand Judaism from within itself, using its own assumptions, its own principles, its own axioms, and trying to see the world through its lens. This was the work of Rav Shamshin Rafal Hirsch in all his works in general, but specifically, we're working on his work that was known as Chorev, where he went through all the commandments in the Torah and tried to explain their reasoning and their rationale. This week, we've got a really tricky one to discuss. Tricky because not only is it nested in the category known as Chukim, but it's also one of the most difficult to discuss. We're discussing what's known as in Hebrew as Zenus, best titled as a sexual ethic. Ethics of who you should and who you should not have an intimate relationship with. But there's a couple of caveats that's going to be important, more so than other commandments. As I mentioned, this is in the category of chukim, which means these aren't classically moral commandments. I'll explain what I mean there. When a person talks about this category of commandment and sort of slips in moral language, from a Jewish standpoint, they have to be quite explicit what they mean. Because when we speak about morality in the area of intimacy and in the area of human relationships, we're not dealing with mishpatim. And it's important to point that out, because when a person says something is moral or immoral, classically we mean in the category of mishpatim. It is immoral to hit someone, it is immoral to speak to speak slander, losh and horror, gossip. These are all ca- uh, commandments that fall squarely in the category of mishpatim. Why? Because I understand what it means to be a human being. I understand what it means to be wronged as a human being. Thereby, to do it to someone else is what we call immoral. You are acting in a way that isn't in accordance with generally accepted values of what it means to be a human being. And we understand this. We don't need the Torah. We don't need a tradition to tell us not to engage in these. It does, but it's not needed. You know these by being a human being. When it comes to chukim, that's not the case. And there is no better or the most sublime expression of a chayk than a sexual ethic. Because this isn't like shatnas, mixing threads, where I can give a beautiful symbolic reason that relates to a moral principle that we know is valued in the Torah. Because remember, when it comes to chukim, or things known as a chuk, it doesn't mean they're irrational. It means there are certain values or certain premises that we simply don't have access to. We can hypothesize based off the Torah's general framework, which is what Rav Hirsch does. He says, look, the validity of his explanation will fall on its probability and its convincingness, but it's going to fall in the realm of a suggestion. But when I'm dealing with mixing threads or sending away the mother bird, we can use our understanding of Judaism to narrow down on a value that's being emphasized here. When it comes to the world of intimacy and human relationships, it's very difficult. A, because we'll never know, and B, we're hitting at the core of something that is very central to someone's identity, and that sensitivity has to be taken into account when you begin to suggest an explanation. And this is what Rav Hirsch does. What is the point and the purpose of a union from the Torah's point of view? Uh, The purpose of a union is for a man and a woman to build a home. For a man and a woman in an ideal world to become a father and a mother. And then not only recreate yourself on a biological level, but recreate yourself on a moral level through education. And this three-stage process, the union, the building of the home, the creation of offspring, and the education of that offspring is the purpose of a union. That's the premise. That is the premise because that is in aid of your task as a human and a Jew. Thereby, what draws a person towards this union, what draws a person towards this intimate state, is in aid of the accomplishment of their task in this world. And thereby, any union without this prerequisite of the dedication to this task is to misuse the union. If it is not in pursuit of Kedushin, which is that idea of separation and union, in the pursuit of the goal, in the pursuit of the task in this world, then it's to misuse this activity and to misuse it in the same way you would misuse any one of your powers. Any one of your powers that you have or pleasures you have access to and you misuse that, 
from the vision that Rav Hirsch has always demonstrated to us is to give in to a more base part of you. And to give in to a more base part of you stands in the way of you accomplishing your task. So in summation of this point, which isn't that profound, it's just building it up, the recognition this is in a specific category of laws, a recognition that the language of morality has to be specific. If a person means by morality that they are not accomplishing their task that has been laid down to them by the Almighty in this world, and by engaging in a union that isn't in the pursuit of the goal of a family, is standing in the way of their purpose in relationship to the Tyra, and that is wrong, then the language of morality can be used. But if they're crossing their wires between the language of mishpatim and the language of chukim, that's not appropriate, both to the category and to the one you're talking to. Thereby, to recap this first point, based off the premises of the Torah, based off the premises of what the value and the goal of a union is, to engage in a union, but without the commitment to the goal, without the commitment to the task, is to give in to a more base part of us, because we are engaging in this union without the commitment to the task, the task of building a home, the task of propagating the species and the education of the species towards a more moral ideal, because that's the goal of the union. And Rav Hesh builds on this. And it's important to point out, we're not talking about any individual Every individual is on their own journey, but in relationship to this painting that Rav Hirsch is displaying before us about the nature of Jewish intimacy and in what is it in aid of, you have these stages of the desire for two people to be together, and off the back of that you build a home, and off the back of that you have children, off the back of that you have education, and that is the, in the pursuit of the highest task that is, a Jew is called upon to engage in. If you only have the first stage, the connection, the intimacy, then that becomes the goal. The goal of that relationship is the pleasure that is received and given. Thereby, from Rav Hirsch's standpoint, he says, well, let's ask a very, very important question here. If that becomes the goal, how long do you still look at yourself as being a creature endowed with a task? If that becomes your highest ideal, if you subdue the human being to that first stage and not the higher moral principles that are lived out through it, that it is a means in aid of, well, then that becomes your goal. And then how long do you look at yourself as a creature with that higher task? When you have this, as he puts it, a more glamorous, as he puts it, a more glamorous task right in front of you. You're not taking it the next steps. You're not taking it along those harder steps towards that higher education. How long do you look at yourself as a creature endowed with a higher task? How long do you look at your items and your property as being gifted, once again, with a task involved in you receiving them? And then how long do you look at other people as also being endowed with a task? Rath Hirsch paints a slippery slope that comes about through a skewed notion of the highest ideal. And thereby, how long do you still keep your pure conception of the Almighty? And if you stop looking at yourself in a certain way, you stop looking at God in a certain way, and eventually you start looking at other people in a certain way, you lose all three perspectives. You lose your relationship to yourself in a very intimate way. You lose your relationship to other people in a very intimate way, and you lose a relationship with the Almighty in an intimate way. And this is a, an aspect of those three cardinal sins, the sexual immorality of Gili Arias, Shvi Chastamen, which is categorized under murder, and Avoy Desire, which is categorized under idol worship. And Rav Hirsch explains that these slippery slopes of either one of these three that you engage in, be it murder, be it sexual immorality, or be it idolatry, one will lead to the other. One leads to its sister. One leads to the other failure. Because the minute there is a skewed notion in what you mean by another person, or what you mean by God, or what you mean by your relationship to your task in this world. On some level, it will lead to the other. If you have a skewed conception of God, how will you look at other human beings? How will you look at your task? If you have a skewed notion of other human beings, how does that mean you look at your relationship to God, and thereby how you look at your relationship to your task? 
And Rav Hirsch sees an intimate relationship between these cardinal sins in the Jewish faith. And in this week, it's really very much on the mistaken notion of your task in this world and living that out in a union. So to recap this quite tricky topic, we're talking about a sexual ethic. These are based off the principles of a task and a goal. The task that is endowed by the Almighty, if you will. A task that is given to you. And as I said, if a person doesn't accept these premises, this entire conversation doesn't make any sense. But the language of morality only makes sense with these premises taken into account. For a person to use the language of immoral, they mean in the context of being given a task, the rejection of that task, the adoption of the first stages of the task without the higher ideals that come along with it, not in the language of mishpatim, not the language of I am a human being, you're a human being, and we can clearly see there is something problematic here. Rav Hirsch points out that especially when it comes to the area of a sexual ethic, it is the hardest for us to be able to connect any sort of grounded reason. The more premises we add, the richer our explanation will come, but it will always remain within the category of chukim. So, have a wonderful week, and as always, thank you so much for listening.